Good morning, church. Ooh, we can do better than that. We can wake ourselves up. Let's try. That's what speakers are supposed to do, you know, so you got to say it twice. So. Good morning, church. There you go. Much better. Good to see each and every one of you. Uh, we are continuing a series where we're looking at some Christmas movies, and we're uh, looking at some spiritual lessons that we can gain from uh, many things, and, and this you can do this. Uh, some churches have movie series each year, and they go through different movies each year, and they gain spiritual lessons. Uh, it's a good way to redeem those things for Jesus and to bring our mind and help us wrap our mind around some uh, Christian overtones and Christian thoughts around some secular things, and uh, it can be a blessing to us, I think, when we try to find the good in these things. Uh, I got a little bit of flack last week. Somebody came up to me. I won't name who they are. Uh, give me a little flat and said, is Elf really your favorite Christmas movie? And like, and, and the person said, uh, like, you're, you weren't just saying that for a lesson. Like, you actually believe that Elf is the best Christmas movie ever. And the answer is yes, Elf is still the best Christmas movie ever. But before Elf, there was another movie. Uh, before Elf came along, uh, the, the movies of my childhood were the Home Alone movies. How many Home Alone fans? How many think Home Alone's maybe a top five Christmas movie? How many of you think Home Alone is your favorite Christmas movie? Do we have anybody? Okay, we've got one or two. Good deal. Uh, so I love Home Alone. I, I actually think I like Home Alone 2 even better. Uh, when I watch these back as an adult, I realize how absolutely ridiculous the movies actually are. Uh, but you don't have to think a lot. They're fun. Uh, they just happen, and you don't have to, like, uh, I can turn it on. I, I like stuff that I can just turn on, and if I'm fiddling, doing other things, I don't feel like I miss a whole lot because it's not got a whole lot to it in a lot of ways. Um, but really, Home Alone has a, a some, it does hit home in its major one theme, that being alone is not all it's cracked up to be, right? Uh there's one image that goes with Home Alone probably more than uh, any other, and that's where Macaulay Culkin looks a little like this, right? You've known it. You can do it. Go ahead, do it. I'm going to pretend that you're opening your mouth like that under your mask, but I can't tell. But, but you know that image. Uh, you know, going around as a kid, if somebody did that, you knew what they were doing. You knew where it came from and, and what started it. Macaulay Culkin... Scared to death, alone in his own home. You see, in that movie, uh, Kevin uh, wants to be home alone. As a matter of fact, he makes a wish for his family to disappear. And just uh, shortly after, his family does disappear. And he says it not just once, he says it twice. He says, I made my family disappear. And then he goes, I made my family disappear. And then he goes to do all the fun stuff that happens when you're home alone. Anybody that's married understands this. If you ever get the house to yourself for like a day and a half, the house to yourself is euphoric, right? It's awesome. Like, you can just leave your clothes everywhere. You can just, you just, you know, dirty dishes can pile up in the sink. But like day two or three, you miss the familiarity of those that are normally around you. And you realize that maybe being all alone isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And uh, I know many of you in this audience may live alone, uh, and that's okay. Uh, but I hope nobody in this audience is trying to go through life alone. I hope you're not trying to navigate life without some sort of support system around you. Uh, because Kevin finds out really quick that for an eight-year-old, uh, being home alone is not all that it's cracked up to be, is it? As a matter of fact, uh, the two uh, wet bandits who would go on in Home Alone 2 to be the sticky bandits, they, they find him at home, and they finally figure out he's all by himself. And here Harry says, Merry Christmas, little fella. We know that you're in there and that you are all alone. You know, the thought of being all alone is not something that's fun. Kevin finds that out. As a matter of fact, uh, just before this in the movie, he goes and he finds a Santa Claus. It was a, a mall Santa who wasn't really Santa. It was very obvious because he didn't have a real beard, that he was not the real Santa, and he had it down below his chin. 
And he says, I know how this works. You're one of his helpers. He says, will you please tell Santa that instead of presents this year, I just want my family back. You see, in this short movie, you go from a, a kid who wants his family to disappear to one that all they want for Christmas is to have their family back. As is the case in both all the Home Alone movies, there's this character that at first looks like a villain or a mystery. And, and in this movie, it's a guy named Marley, and he meets with uh, Kevin in the church. And it's interesting, he says, you can be too old for a lot of things, but you're never too old to be afraid. You know, I was joking this week uh, in a preacher, or I think it may have been two weeks ago, in a preacher group, the, there was a conversation going on about ghosts and whether or not people believe in ghosts and that sort of thing. And I jokingly say, I said, we're all preachers and we've all been in empty church buildings late at night by ourselves. And if we don't all believe in ghosts, nobody will. Uh, because, you know, uh, Paul can attest this. These buildings, if you're in them by yourself late at night with the lights off, they creak and they make noises. And you, every time you hear one, you wonder if it's a person or if what is that noise? Um, I, you, m most of you know I have a fear of birds. I, I still fear birds. You'll never, the, the worst thing in my life, the worst fear in my life is somebody making me go into that thing at the zoo where you feed all the lorikeets. Uh, my kids go by every time and say, can we go in there? I'm like, no, you cannot go in there. <laughs> When you can get your mama to come and take you, you can go in there. But when daddy here, we're not going in there. As a matter of fact, it's gotten worse. I don't know if you know this now, but because of COVID, you have to go on a very certain path and you have to go through the bird area. So if you want to see somebody power walk, come with me through the bird area. Like, we're getting out of there fast. I just don't like birds. They, they still bother me. I watched the birds, Alfred Hitchcock's the birds, at a, too young of an age. And uh, it stuck with me. But you know, the reality is, is we are all afraid of things. And sometimes it's things that don't really matter, like birds. Like, I know that a bird's probably not going to be the reason that I die. Uh, I, I'm aware of that. Uh, so sometimes we have these fears that are not really well-founded in data, but we still fear them. But we all fear some real things, don't we? We, feel, we fear some serious things. Uh, we fear, many times, we fear death. We, we fear uh, being alone, living alone, dying alone. We fear losing people around us that we love. You know, when life happens and life hits, some of those fears become more real. I, I won't sugarcoat this, that during this season, when, quite honestly, death has been put into, in, our, our, in the forefront, of our lives as Americans. We see a lot about death right now. Uh, I, I would be lying if I didn't say that that's caused me some anxiety. You know, it's kind of made me think more about death and, and what happens at death and, and how uh, vicious death really can be. And so I've had this, this fear. I've, I've come to, uh, there's a fear called autophobia. It's the fear of being alone. And it hit me this week in a real way um, there was a post online about, uh, they had a bunch of uh, iPads set up that were ready to go into these ICU units where people are all alone, and many of them are dying alone, and it just hit me. Wow. Can you imagine the fear of being alone and dying alone? That's a real fear that we have. The joy for us as Christians, though, is that we serve a God who knows we have fears and anxieties like that one. And he's constantly, I like to say it this way, God's constantly settling our fears because he knows we're going to have fears, right? He, he knows we're susceptible to fear, and therefore, because we're susceptible to fear, God is constantly in a constant state of, of settling the fears that we may have as Christians he does that through all sorts of ways. You know, sometimes I go through these and I go through these pretty rarely. Sometimes he's using the people that are around us to settle our fears and calm us. Sometimes he's going to use his Bible. Uh, sometimes he's going to use that indwelling spirit within us to calm and soothe us. You know, God's going to use all sorts of tools, but he's constantly calming our fears. And, and I take some pride in knowing uh, as a Christian that I'm not alone. That every, seemingly every Christian 
that's ever walked has had fears and had to have their fears calmed by God who loves us and cares for us, but sometimes we don't see that in the forefront of our minds and we struggle with that. I think about Elijah when he goes up and he thinks he's all alone. And this is what he says. He says, I alone am left. You know, there's nobody else left. It's just me. And God, God takes him and he refreshes him and he revives him. He says, listen, you're not alone. You may feel alone right now. But there's a whole lot of people back down below who are not up on this mountain that still have not bowed to Baal. What a powerful statement to know and feel you are not alone. Because intellectually, it's just like those fears. Of intellectually, I know I'm not alone, but that doesn't stop me sometimes from feeling like I'm home alone and all by myself. And so God is constantly settling those fears. I want to look at a couple of passages he uses to do this. One, I just want to start in 1 Peter 3. And really, this we're going to take this passage and we're going to, it has a quote in it from the Old Testament. We're going to go back to it too. It says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Keep perspective of what's happening. You, un, you need to understand that if you're out to do good, if you're eager and you're anxious to do good, there's nobody that can really harm you. And now, they may bring physical harm. They may bring temporary harm. But there's no one that can eternally harm you if you're out to do good. He says, but even if you should suffer, right? Even if you do ha have harm in your life for what is right, you are blessed. You know, that's not the way we sometimes think about persecution. We don't see somebody overseas, see Christians being persecuted and say, oh, wow, they are blessed right now. But that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. That if our mind is in the right place and our perspective is in the right place on doing good, you know, we can still be blessed even though somebody may be beating us to death. Even if we are all alone in a physical sense, if the world sees us as all alone, we don't stand alone because we're out to do good. And he uses this quote, and it's from Isaiah, and we're going to go back to the, where the quote comes from in just a second. He says, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Don't be scared. Why? Or how, how do we do that? I think really this is the how. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. You put God in His proper place, and your fears will come down to their proper place. There'll be things we have to deal with, there'll be things we have to go with, but we understand that the fears that we may be facing are temporary. And I think that's a message our world needs to hear right now. That these things that we go through as society and as a world right now, they are temporary. They will not last. They will end in time. And we as Christians need to be the bearer of that good news. We need to be shouting to the world, listen, this, this will end. What, even if it doesn't end in our lifetime, it's going to end for those of you who revere Christ as Lord. It's going to come to an end. You're not going to have to finish life alone. Because we have a God who loves us and cares for us. He says, when your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. I use this passage a lot because I think it's so beautiful. Uh, it, it's been misused sometimes, I think, but what it is is so beautiful. I hate when it's been misused. He says, listen, you need to be living a life where when people see you, they see the way you are handling your fears is different than how everybody else is handling their fears. And when they see that you're handling it, it different, you need to be ready to give the answer. And by the way, let's, let's note the context here. He says, you need to be ready to give the answer. And there's going to be some people that are out trying to harm you sometimes. You need to be ready to give the answer always. For the hope that you have in you. But then he says, remember to do this with gentleness. Remember to do this with respect. Don't think yourself haughty. Don't, don't have a prideful attitude as, as a Christ follower. Go into it with humility and respect. And if you have that humility and respect, they're going to be more keen to want a piece of what you have. So he uses this, and this is actually a quote from Isaiah 8. Do not fear their threats, nor be frightened. And Isaiah 8, um, I've said this before, I think we really need to understand this. Uh, when we see a quote in the New Testament, we need to go back to the Old Testament. 
And not just see the quote, but see the context of that quote. Because we bring, when we bring something in the New Testament, it brings all that context with it. And sometimes we miss some things because we don't see all that context with it. Well, this has got some beautiful context with it in Isaiah chapter 8. It gives us a little more context to what, what was going on when that quote happened. Isaiah is dealing with the people that don't want to hear. And God's trying to reassure Isaiah. And he says, this is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me. God is calming my fears. His strong hand is on me and he's calming me. And he's warning me. This is not just a calming from a sense of, oh, it's all going to be okay. He says, listen, my hand is on you. Do not go the way of the people that are around you. The world's going to try to pull you into this, this hamster wheel of fear and anxiety. Be careful of that. He says, don't, and he says, don't call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Don't get so wrapped up in, in all these things of the earth. We need to hear this, church. Our, our people need to hear this. Our church people need to hear this. That if we spend our life being wrapped up in conspiracy theories, people are going to wonder who our Lord really is. And we need to be careful that we don't just get ourselves wrapped up in all the things of the world, the anxiety of the world, uh, everything that they're throwing at us and all the conspiracy theories because it does not take far to hit a conspiracy theory right now. You throw a rock, you'll hit one. And you know what? Here's the truth. A conspiracy theory may turn out to be true one out of every million times. And you may just happen to hit the one out of a million times. But most of the time, when you start down this road of conspiracy theories, you're going to hit a bunch of falsehood and people who are making more out of something than what is reality. And Isaiah knew that. And when Isaiah knew that, he says, listen, you or God knew this, and he's telling Isaiah, listen, you can't just get wrapped up in all this stuff because you get wrapped up in all these conspiracy theories, and you're going to be pulled away from what matters most. And you're going to start spreading lies. And if people can't trust you in the temporary things, how are they going to trust you when you're trying to tell them something about eternity? Church, we, we've got to be above reproach when it comes to this. We've got to sometimes choose not to speak. And, and I'm preaching to myself right now, church, because I, I, I know sometimes we've got to choose not to open our big mouths. And I have a big mouth, so I understand this. Well, sometimes we've got to choose to let things slide and let things pass and go away because the things that the world's caught up in don't really matter. He says, don't fear what they fear. Don't dread it. Let's say the conspiracy theory comes out to be true. you still got God on your side. He says, don't dread it because the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. You keep God in perspective and these things of this earth will remain in perspective. He's the one you are to fear. He's the one you are to dread. You keep God in perspective and our fears and anxieties will stay in perspective. And then we're still not going to fight with them. We're going to still struggle with them. I don't... If you're a person who struggles with fear and anxiety, I don't want you to believe that I'm minimizing what you're going through. I know it can be real and it can overwhelm you at times. I just want to bring you into remembrance that you serve a God that's still bigger than those fears. He's still bigger than those anxieties. In the Home Alone movie, Kevin's mom is trying hard to get back to her son and there's a whole bunch of things standing in the way, roadblocks that are standing in the way they're keeping her from getting to her son this is what she says because of that. She says, I don't care if I have to get out on your one runway. She's at the airport. And hitchhike. It costs me everything I own. If I have to sell my soul to the devil himself, I'm going to get home to my son. Let me tell you this. I'm not proposing that you should ever try to sell your soul to the devil. Okay? It's probably not the best use of terms. But it's what she says in the movies. Because she's a mom who is intent on going after her son. And she is intent on pursuing after her son. I got to thinking, you know, sometimes we, we put God in these boxes and we, we think of him as a very paternal person and that's primarily the, the language that the Bible uses to talk about God, that he's our, our father. But God still has some motherly instincts, okay? He's still out to pursue you, but like a mother pursues after her children. He's still out to bring his people, bring people back to him. I want you to look at this passage in Romans chapter 5. It's, it's really cool. Notice this word, for while we were still helpless. All right? 
we start at helpless. That's the word Paul uses here. While, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay? We're helpless and we're ungodly. And he says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone may dare to die. But God demonstrates His love for us that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. He goes, we're, we're helpless. That doesn't sound that bad, does it? You know, we've all been helpless. He says, while we're helpless. And then he goes, he says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ still pursued us. When, he pursued us when we were helpless. And He pursued us while we were sinners. That's a little bit more intense, isn't it? It shows that we're, we're people who have missed the mark. We're people that are struggling with the wrong that may face in our life. And then look at what He does in the next verse here. He says, Much more then, having now been justified as blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies... We go from helpless to sinners, and now all of a sudden we are enemies. Now that shows where we stood. We stood in a place where we were actively against the cross because of our sin. While we were still enemies, God reconciled us to Him through the death of His Son. And much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. He brought us into right relationship. Not only were we helpless, not only were we sinners, but we were enemies of the cross. And he said, I will go to the ends of the earth to find you and to bring you to me. We serve a God who pursues us. God does not owe us that. God has all power and all authority to, at this moment, Object us all to, to being minions and slaves right now if he so chose to do that. God doesn't owe us to pursue us. If anything, it should be us pursuing after God. But we see that the clear image is that God, while we were helpless, he pursues us. While we were, while we were sinners, he pursued us. And even while we were enemies, we were pursued. Think about who wrote this. Paul. Paul was helpless. And an enemy, I mean a sinner, but most of all we think of Paul what? As an enemy of the cross. And we see how God, even in his abject failure, God continued to pursue after Paul. And I'm convinced that today he still actively pursues after us. Um, C.S. Lewis was probably the, the Christian voice of uh, many, many have, you know, it's past now, but those who were uh, maybe raised in uh, World War II times. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis was a, a constant voice, a constant figure. C.S. Lewis did not come to Christianity willingly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to read this quote to you that he shares about how he came, uh, how he came to know Jesus and came to know God. Uh, he says this, he says, You need to picture me alone in that room in Magdalene. Night after night, feeling, whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet, that which I greatly feared had last come upon me. In, in the third term of 1929, I gave in and I admitted that God was God. And I knelt and I prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I didn't want to come to know God. I didn't want to believe in God, but I came to a point where I just could not deny God anymore. And he says, I was dejected. I was reluctant. There was no reason God should have heard me in that moment. He said, I, I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing. He said, I couldn't then understand this. He said, the divine humility, the humility of God, which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape. He says, I, I, I came to an understanding and a belief that
that I could not deny anymore, and I wanted in everything in me to move to go away from God, but God was pursuing me. God was a divine being who becomes flesh in Jesus to reconcile his enemies to him. What a powerful image we have. What a powerful God we serve that would take our fears and anxieties, our aloneness, our being home alone, our not knowing what's next, the fear of maybe enemies pursuing after us, and yet, even in all of our failures in that process, because we fell a lot, He's still pursuing after you, church. He still wants you. He still loves you. He still wants to be involved in your life, even when you're a failure. What a mighty God we serve. So even if my family disappears, even if I'm alone from worldly standards, I never stand alone because I have a God who is constantly pursuing after me. And because of that, I'm blessed. I'm blessed beyond measure. And because of that, I can't help but tell the world that, listen, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. Calm down. We've got a God that's in total control. And when we serve a God in total control, we don't have to fear the way the world fears. Let's pray together. Our God, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you that despite the fact that we were helpless, despite the fact that we were sinners, and despite the fact that we were enemies of the cross, you still reconciled us to you. And that pattern played out in redemption for all men, but it plays out in each one of our lives. That we've all had those moments where we've rebelled and we've struggled and we've fought against and you still, to this day, maintain relationship with us and we praise you for that. Help those of us who may be struggling with anxiety and fear in this season to lean into you and to your mighty strong hand. And let us fear and adore you as king. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us in all the ways that you do. We are bl a blessed people. Even in the midst of pandemic and fear, we are a blessed people. God, forgive us when we've failed to see it. And help us every day to see you for who you are. The God who pursues us even when we feel that we're home alone. God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus we pray. And the church together says, Amen. We love you. And we're thankful that you're here. And we're thankful for those that are watching online. Uh, we want to give this opportunity that if, you, if you've been struggling through life and your fear and anxiety is on high alert, and maybe you need some, God's ready to use some people to calm you. And uh, maybe he's wanting to use us. Let us know that you're struggling. Or maybe you've never become a Christian. Maybe you've never submitted to the calling of God. Maybe you've never decided to put Christ on as king of your life and to wash away the old self and to rise up a new self in baptism. Maybe you've never done that. We, we would love to make that happen today. It's not an easy life. You're still going to have to battle fears and anxiety. But here's what I can promise you. It's not the easiest life, but it's the best life. And when we're living that life and we're walking that path with Jesus by our side, there's nothing can touch us, church. We're of all people most blessed. If you have any spiritual need, come on, we'll stand and sing together this morning.